and uh, we're going to talk in the second lecture about biological applications of neutron scattering. You may have noticed in the first one there were not many biological applications, and that's because I was explaining principles of neutron scattering to people, which would be useful in biological applications. And this trend may continue today. I don't know yet what I'm going to talk about. And uh, the problem with this type of presentation is you can't see all the slides at once. So I'll be jumping forwards and backwards and making you dizzy between different uh, slides, I think. Just to recap on the last lecture, we discussed diffraction techniques. Uh, we discussed... Um, fibers and, we, and uh, small angle scattering briefly, I may come back to that, and dynamics. In particular, we concentrated on vibrations in systems and how uh, vibrations uh, manifest themselves in neutron spectra as peaks at non-zero frequencies, at energies different from zero and how they depend on the, the intensity of the neutron scattering depends on the amplitude of the vibration. We talked about local bond stretching, bond angle bending vibrations, metal vibrations. We talked about collective vibrations in, in macromolecules that are extended over the, the whole molecule. These tend to be low frequency. We discussed how these are modified when the ligand binds. And uh, we talked about lattice vibrations that are present in crystals of biological molecules. have not really been probed experimentally much yet, uh, but we discussed that neutrons can, in principle, detect them. Um, by scanning Q and omega space in the, the uh, unit cell of reciprocal space, which is called the first grid one zone. So that's where we were. We were just about to talk about this thing, the glass transition. Now, I think in this course you're going to get lots of people talking about this. You probably have already. And um, there are some elements of the glass transition that uh, biological molecules possess. So the very last slide was this one, in which we um, reminded ourselves that elastic incoherent scattering dominated by hydrogen atoms in most organic systems uh, is what happens when nothing moves. And that when you, things start to move, then the intensity of the elastic scattering will reduce, according to this equation, approximately. Yeah? This is assuming that the elastic scattering is Gaussian in Q. And uh, it's a common assumption. We'll come back to that, non-Gaussian elastic scattering later, I think. But anyway, if Q is small relative to the displacement, then you can see this will hold uh, in a Taylor expansion. And the, uh, the mean square displacement, then, of the atoms uh, can be derived. And this is an early example of the mean square displacement averaged over the atoms in my globe in the hydrogen atoms as a function of temperature. One sees an approximately linear regime at low temperatures. And then something else happening. We know that the linear dependence of the mean square displacement of an atom as a function of temperature is consistent with harmonic motion. As vibrations, like we were talking about. Hmm? Um, now, maybe those listening who are really clever will realize that even in the harmonic approximation, even there, 
Technically speaking, the mean square displacement does not vary linearly with temperature. And that's the case when you have a quantum harmonic oscillator as opposed to a classical one. However, these quantum corrections turn out to be small for uh, biological systems that, that vibrate over these temperatures. They become significant below 50 kelvins. So that's not a problem. So what's happening up here? The mean square displacements are larger than one would expect from a harmonic model. So that means there are extra displacements taking place. And these can be considered in the context of an uh, energy landscape. Energy landscape is the energy of the system, that's the z-axis here, as a function of some conformational coordinates here. It's in two dimensions. The full energy landscape is in three n dimensions, where n is the number of atoms in the system. So it has many, many dimensions to it. But uh, one can approximately appreciate what's happening just by looking at this mountain range here. This is called the Smoky Mountains. This is Klingman's Dome up here. Up here. And the problem with that is you can drive up it. That, and, and because you can drive up it, this does not represent a macromolecular energy landscape because it's too easy to get to the top in the Smoky Mountains. Here, the probability of reaching the top is very low. Probability of being in the bottom, due to Boltzmann's constant, is very high. So as you're at low temperatures, the protein or whatever is just vibrating at, uh, in a single energy wells. And then when you have enough kinetic energy, it's able to jump over the wells, uh, over the low passes between the wells, cross the barriers. Crossing these barriers then leads to, as we saw in the last lecture, uh, quasi-elastic neutron scattering. And it's re it uh, leads to this acceleration in the temperature dependence of the mean square displacements. And it makes the thing look like a liquid. The, the liquid-like behavior is when these barriers can be crossed. And thing, things becomes more fluid and, and less viscous. The glassy behavior, how does a protein resemble a glass? Well, when you cool a liquid down, you're going to uh, trap it in many different potential minima. If you think of a protein, what that means is that if you look at a, a sample of protein molecules, individual proteins will be trapped in different minima. They'll be trapped there, they'll stay there. So if I have a collection of myoglobin molecules, they all have slightly different structures forever, if you keep them at low temperature. There is structural heterogeneity. And this was uh, um, probed by other techniques in the 1970s and 80s, particularly by Hans Frauenfelder and colleagues. Frauenfelder is at Los Alamos National Lab, in which they studied the rebinding kinetics of carbon monoxide to myoglobin. Now, what that means is you can dissociate the ligand of myoglobin, which in this case was carbon monoxide, and watch it rebind. The kinetics of the rebinding can then be measured. And they found non-exponential rebinding kinetics. What does that mean? That means it's not simple rebinding. There's uh, um, different processes going on, which they interpreted in terms of different barriers to rebinding. And that these different barriers originated from proteins being trapped in different conformational states at low temperature. So that's kind of a glassy protein picture. Um, there was also in the 1990s and onwards a discussion 
as to why proteins start functioning around about here at this transition point. Some of them do. Uh, this, this discussion is controversial, and maybe we'll get to it later on. But the idea was that as soon as this barrier crossing is allowed, then somehow there's enough lubrification, dynamical lubrification in the system that allows the proteins to start functioning. In other words, an enzyme to start reacting or an inhibitor to bind or unbind. And in particular, the group of uh, Petsco in um, Brandeis University um, produced data like this, but from X-ray crystallography, where the thermal so-called B-factors from crystallography can be interpreted similarly to these uh, mean square displacements. And they found that just where this transition took place, there was an onset of inhibitor binding in crystals of ribonucleus. So that was a, a much discussed paper there. Okay. Here's the, uh, another view of this, this time as a function of hydration. You see, we can prepare samples for neutrons um, either with water surrounding them or not. Um, we would want to hydrate a, a protein. What, what I'm saying is mainly for proteins, but it holds for other biological systems too, of course, such as membranes and RNAs and things like that. So I'll mention mostly proteins, so. So, hydrating a protein powder makes it more lifelike. Um, but the hydration will scatter neutrons. So what one does typically in these experiments, these dynamic neutron scattering experiments, is one hydrates the protein in D2O and not H2O. Why would you do that? Well, D doesn't scatter neutrons anywhere near as powerfully as H does. And so the water becomes, the approximation is that the water is then transparent to neutrons. In fact, though, D does scatter neutrons. Uh, deuterium does. And if you have a lot of water, that will maybe contribute half of your scattering signal, even so. So, uh, but if you have powders which you slowly, gradually hydrate, so that there's, say, a monolayer coverage of water molecules, and then maybe a bilayer, trilayers kind of thing, um, you'll still have only a small amount of solvent that won't contribute much to the scattering. So this is, in this case, calculated protein, uh, mean square displacements of a protein at low hydration, meaning only a few water molecules per protein and at least monolayer. So you see there's a difference. The water is needed for the activation of these internal anharmonic dynamics. So hydration clearly plays an important role. And that's been much investigated in protein dynamics in general through simulation, through various spectroscopic and diffraction techniques, and through neutron scattering. So uh, one question then is, um, what types of motions are actually excited? So we, we come back to this slide showing that uh, there are, there's extra displacements taking place, and we're suggesting they might involve barrier crossing, but in principle, with, as I mentioned in the last lecture, incoherent neutron scattering arises from self-correlations in atomic motions. That means single atoms where they are compared to where they were, and does not give direct information on correlated motions. They may arise from correlated motions, but we do not know that per se. Uh, so these displacements can, in principle, arise from 
side chains that are undergoing conformational changes, metal groups rotating, or uh, large fluctuations of, uh, I mean, fluctuations of large groups of atoms moving relative to each other. And distinguishing between this local and global internal motions of biological systems is, is a major challenge. So how do we do that? Well, simulation helps us, of course. And here, a technique has been used um, called principal component analysis, um, which I'll briefly skip over. What you do is you calculate the matrix of interatomic distance fluctuations. So there's one atom, I, its position at a given time relative to the average position. So you multiply that by another atom's position relative to the average at the same time. You see these are instantaneous correlations in positions. Those are the, those are the elements, then, of this uh, intratomic uh, distance fluctuation matrix. It's called a covariance matrix. And we diagonalize that, and that gives us the principal components of the motion. In other words, you can then find um, collective coordinates that will encapsulate the maximum of the variance in the fluctuations. So, what happens when we look at this dynamical transition? In this analysis, it was, it was published in uh, PRL a while ago. I'll give you the reference if you like, but this is all really educational, so um, rather than uh, um, kind of a research seminar. Anyway, in this analysis, we have harmonic modes that remain roughly harmonic. And those, you see, there are many of them, 7,000 or so. And then the remaining modes of motion have been classified as either quasi-harmonic or multi-minima. And quasi-harmonic is like this. Oops, I've got, this is the arrow I need. Um, quasi-harmonic modes have roughly parabolic shapes. That means that as you step along these principal component modes, you put yourself at one end and vary the coordinates of all the atoms that collectively displace themselves, uh, you'll have a roughly parabolic shape, but that the effective force constant, in other words, the stiffness of the potential, uh, varies with temperature. So it's not strictly harmonic, it's quasi-harmonic. And then multi-minimum modes are, of course, not harmonic. They involve jumping. So you see, as you increase the temperature of this protein with thousands of atoms, there's a small number of quasi-harmonic modes appear above this transition. And an even smaller number of multi-minimum modes, uh, 300 kelvins, there's only seven of those, but they are contributing a large proportion of the excess mean squared displacement over the harmonic level. So what this is saying is maybe this transition is relatively simple. There are not complicated large numbers of modes that get excited. That's what this is saying. So this would be a movie, except I can't show movies here, showing the first anharmonic mode that gets activated, and you would see groups of helices in mind. These, these tubes here mean, represent helices. And you'd say this group here, which is hundreds of atoms, moving as a rigid block relative to other groups like this. That's what you would see. In other words, the, the modes that seem to be excited at the lowest temperatures at which we get liquid-like behavior, seem to be collective modes, collective motions. So you can now look. What you can do is go along these, in your simulation, go along these modes, again, step along the modes and calculate the free energy. 
You do this by simply the population as a function of the collective coordinate that the modes represent. This is a one of them. If you remember, um, some of them are quasi-elastic. In other words, they're roughly the one minimum, uh, but it gets um, the minimum gets broader with temperature. And here's one that uh, only above, say, 260K uh, at or above, you see this multiple, multi-minimum type behavior appear. And this is the mode at which we see the earliest multi-minimum behavior, 180 kelvins. Something happens in a protein that this collective motion gets excited and appears to involve transitions of large objects between two minima. So that's how we can look at what's happening in this uh, in this transition. So I want to continue with elastic scattering now and mention that uh, there is um, uh, that this is a sum. If you have a system, you do a dynamic neutron scattering experiment with incoherent scattering. Because everything is self-correlations, then you sum over these individual self-correlations. So elastic scattering is a sum of these various terms depending on the individual mean square displacements. And uh, if you look in a simulation again of a protein, you will find a distribution of mean square displacements. This kind of a minimum value, which is the uh, set by the vibrational properties of the system. And then as you look at uh, other, the, pop the population is, non is significant of uh, atoms in the protein that are undergoing quite large mean square displacements. There. So you see an asymmetric thing. And one of my ex-students there decided that a function called a viable function, which is this dotted line, would fit that. So now you see that the idea of a single mean squared displacement to represent a molecule is somewhat misleading. We shouldn't really plot these single mean squared displacements as a function of temperature, should we? Because we're actually looking at an asymmetric distribution. So you can plug in this function, this viable function then, and use that instead. Yeah. That's an alternative. And so he's done that. And if you do that now, this is a, this is a, a protein. Um, I've actually forgotten which one. It's a it's a thermophilic protein. And what we've plotted now is the log of the elastic scattering as a function of q squared. Right. So log of this is a function of q squared. And if this equation is true. And you forget the sum for now, right? If we assume that sum is not there, we just have an average mean squared displacement. And this equation is true, then you plot log of s against q squared, and you will get a straight line. You'll get a straight line, won't you? The slope of it gives you minus one third of the mean squared displacement. So where is that plot? There it is. The experimental data calculate and um, collected from Grenoble are there. And you see it's absolutely not a straight line. So the elastic scattering at 300 kelvins or room temperature from, I would suggest, almost any biological system does not obey this equation. It is non Gaussian. This is a Gaussian approximation. Again, assuming we're not summing over different atoms now. So um, what's happening is the fact that we are summing, the sum of a Gaussian is not a Gaussian. That's, that's mathematical. You sum different Gaussian functions, and the, 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 the result is not a Gaussian. You can assume this distribution, then. Fit that, and that's the straight line. That, that works pretty well here. So that can be used to derive these parameters, and you can get from that distribution, if you like, an average mean square displacement. 
Could you say that logo? There's a physical meaning as to why we use that function. Is there a physical meaning? The question was, I'll repeat the question. Is there a physical meaning as to why we use that function? And the answer is it's the one that reproduces the simulation data reasonably well. So, no, apart from that, it's not derived from, from any other physical model. And uh, since um, we have um, done that, other people have suggested other functions that, that do just as well. So, the main reason is not really to present this function, it's to, 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 um, to get over the principle that uh, um, the elastic incoherent scattering from biological systems at physiological temperatures um, can be non-Gaussian. And that the non-Gaussian behavior arises from heterogeneity in the mean square displacements. Some atoms don't move far, as other atoms do, and that leads to this non-Gaussian behavior. So one should be able to exploit that experimentally to derive information from elastic scattering, not just on the average mean square displacement, but also on uh, the distribution of mean square displacements in one system. And so very recently, people have been starting to do that. Just present some. Uh, this is, um, if you like, some biology here. Um, it's the result of this analysis for a thermophilic, it's a dehydrofolate reductase, thermophilic and mesophilic, showing that the thermophilic protein has higher fluctuations than the mesophilic one. So, why is that interesting? Well, a thermo for those of you that um, are so terribly physical when you're listening that you don't know what thermophilic and mesophilic is, a thermophilic organism likes to live in hot temperatures. The mesophilic is like us, it lives at our temperatures. So one of the questions in biophysics is what keeps thermophilic organisms stable? Why do their proteins not denature and unfold at higher temperatures. And one of the ideas was, well, they're kind of tighter objects, that they have stronger forces in the proteins that are holding them together. If uh, thermophilic proteins have stronger forces holding them together, then you might think that the fluctuations are lower. So in general, the uh, enthalpy, internal enthalpy of the system um, increases when the fluctuations go down. And this is the opposite. This is showing that our thermophilic organism fluctuates more uh, than the mesophilic one does. So if you like, that's counterintuitive. We all love counterintuitive stuff, don't we? So, never mind that. So, there we go. Let's get to SNS now. This is SNS here at Oak Ridge National Lab, and uh, we have a spectrometer called BASIS here, um, which uh, can be used to measure elastic scattering. Now here what's plotted for a protein called P450, cytochrome P450, is the elastic scattering as a function of temperature. See that there? So as I mentioned, at very low temperatures, the elastic scattering is high because the atoms are not moving. You increase the temperature and it goes down slowly and then there is a transition with a large decrease. And that's this dynamical transition we're talking about. So you see here is a function of Q. Huh? So, um, this is, these are equations that I roughly showed you before, never mind that one. Here's your Gaussian approximation. You'll see, if there's some sharp people in the audience, you'll see there's a 1 over 6 here, whereas in the previous slide there's 1 over 3. And that is simply uh, how you define the mean squared displacement. 
If it's as a fluctuation from the mean, then that's 1 over 3. And if it's as a displacement, it's 1 over 6. So that's not really important. So here's our Gaussian approximation, you see. That is it. We saw it doesn't hold, for some systems at least. So how can we improve that? Well, you can do an expansion. You can do an expansion in Q and include, include a Q to the fourth term. And if you do that and do the math, then you see that this factor that multiplies the Q to the fourth term is the variance of the mean squared displacement. So you get an idea from that as to, as to what the width is of the distribution of the mean squared displacements. And so this is a simple experimental tool uh, that uh, you can use now instead of fitting a straight line to something that's not a straight line, you, you fit a curve with this extra parameter and derive the variance. So this is you now this is says JPCB in press, but actually it was published uh, a year ago or something. And again, other people have had similar ideas. It, it just goes to show for the point of this lecture that. The non-Gaussian behavior in elastic scattering can be exploited, even by a simple experiment, experiment, to get information that's more than just the average mean square displacement, but also in the variance or distribution of mean square displacements. So, that's what's done here. You see some of these fits to non-Gaussian scattering that have been done to experimental data. And you see here um, experiments on this uh, cytochrome P450 um, showing the hydration dependence of this transition. Also comparing simulation with experiment there. And this is for two different spectrometers, so we'll get back to what that means in a minute. One is basis, the other is HFBS. But the first thing I want to show you is we also get this variance. You see, we do this Q to the fourth fit. We, um, and we see that the variance then in the mean square displacement so on HFBS, it's fairly it's low at low temperatures when the protein is glassy. You know, each protein molecule is trapped. In a, in a vibrational state, and well, even then, there is a distribution of uh, displacements. It's not very wide. But as soon as we get to 300 kelvins, the variance in the mean squared displacement is much higher. So there are atoms that are doing crazy things at 300 kelvins in a protein. Okay, now. This business of two instruments, what does that mean? Well, as you see, we have two instruments, and we get different values of the mean squared displacement at any given temperature on these two instruments. What is that? Well, that means you can't trust anything in neutron scattering, doesn't it? It doesn't give the same result. Well, you use two different instruments, and you get completely different um, absolute values of the displacements going on. And um, um, some people have, been, have in the past compared results on different instruments and noticed this kind of thing and said, oh, well, it's all rubbish. But um, the reason is that these instruments have different energy resolutions. Here you see maybe that this one is, has an energy resolution, delta E, of 3.5 micro electron volts, whereas this one has an energy resolution of 1 micro electron volt. So, um, oh, we have another question from Ming. We'll get to that. Um, so, what does that mean? Well, this resolution is poorer than this one. Um, what that means is if you had a pure elastic scatterer with no motions again, the elastic peak here would be uh, smaller and wider 
it would have this width, um, whereas here it's, it's a narrower. And it also means that motions here can be detected which are not present in this one. Because the resolution of this is 3.5 microelectron volts, only fast motions can be detected. So, um, if you remember, maybe the energy is the reciprocal of time, so a low frequency motion occurs at long time scales. So if you want to look at slow motions, you look at uh, low frequencies or low energies. So this is the instrument for slow motions. It's got a high energy resolution. This is an instrument for fast motions. And that explains why these mean squared displacements on HFBS are more higher than those on the basis. So there are extra motions contributing here that could not be resolved by basis. So you see that. You also see that the variance here um, is much greater for the high resolution instrument than it is for the low resolution instrument. So why is that? That means that a lot of these crazy motions are slow. They're slow so that they can't be detected by basis, but they can by HFBS. So what are these time scales here? We'd be comparing 100 picoseconds and 1 nanosecond. That's effectively the difference in the time scale, roughly speaking, accessible. OK, Ming's question. Ming. Ming says, how does the diffusion coefficient change with temperature? And he's wondering if the relationship of the mean square displacement with temperature is caused by the diffusion coefficient change with temperature. That's the question. How does the diffusion coefficient change with temperature? And is, has that got a, is that related to the mean square displacement? Now, I wish I had a blackboard here, but you can't, uh, you can't use them in these lectures, can you? So I'll have to explain things verbally. You can see if you can draw the picture on a blackboard yourself. Um, I can use this little arrow. So I'm going to trace with this little arrow a mean square displacement, which will be this axis, as a function of temperature. Nothing will appear on the screen. You have to imagine, the, the, imagine it happening. We'll get an initial shoot up of the mean square displacement at fast times. Now this, this is time now. Sorry, time mean square displacement. It shoots up initially. And that's due to all these vibrations starting. And then you'll get various phases. And it could sort of curl over like this. Or it could vary linearly with temperature. If it varies linearly, the, the, the mean square displacement varies linearly with temperature, then a certain Mr. Einstein comes into play. Because he has an equation that allows you to derive a diffusion coefficient from that slope. Yeah. So then it's valid. But if you don't have a simple dependence of the mean square displacement on temperature, then Einstein's equation cannot be used. And the concept of a diffusion coefficient is fishy shouldn't refer to a diffusion coefficient unless you have a linear dip displacement of the mean square displacement, a linear dependence of the mean square displacement as a function of time. So that's the question. As to whether the, the diffusion constant can be used to, de to describe these phenomena, one has to look at the mean square displacements and how they vary with time. Now, um, let me see. How long have we got left? I want to skip a lot of this stuff. So you guys are going to get, because I don't know any way to do it other than skipping, you're going to get flashed through a lot of stuff. Um, and uh, we are going to move on to um, large-scale structural changes in proteins.
So we'll do a bit of that, then we'll do a little bit of spin echo spectroscopy, and then some small angle. So, but not the type of small angle that uh, people generally do for biological complexes. And then we'll be finished. So, structural change, what's that? Here's my energy landscape view of some large structural change in a protein. So, in fact, this is one of the proteins that we're doing drug design on right now. It's called RAS. And if we can stop this thing happening, this change in structure between here and here, then uh, there's a hope that lung, colon, and pancreatic cancer can all be cured. Why am I making such a bold statement? Well, this little protein here is called RAS. And it's at the center of the network of met metabolic pathways in these three cancers. When it mutates, it gets switched on, gets stuck in this state. And if we can stop that from happening, then it looks like it'll be difficult for the, those cancers to mutate around um, what, what's happening. So that's why it's interesting. So what's this change? It's a, ch it's a molecular switch that uh, switches from one state to another one, depending on whether ATP or ADP is bound. And then um, um, dynamically what happens is we have one point on the energy landscape that's say what we call a reactant. You change ADP into ADP and it will go over the mountain range to another shape. That's the product. And this is roughly a microsecond time scale range. And we have nanoseconds here. So I don't think we're going we're to see that with neutrons. We're not going to see that whole change. And the, the, the reason is that um, um, microseconds is a little bit out of the of the time scale at which neutrons can be active in. Although maybe not, we may be nearly there with spin echo spectroscopy. But at any rate, we can do this bit, the nanosecond motions, and get some invaluable clues. So here's this particular protein that's uh, switched on here, and when it's switched on, the cells grow. The tumor cells get bigger. The tumors get bigger when this thing is switched on. And there it is switched off. The tumors stop growing. So how do, how do we look at these structural changes? And we want to do that with neutrons. This would, would have been a simulation that, uh, that um, shows the structure going from one to another. Um, but the way to look at this is there are different pathways that a molecule might be able to take. Here's uh, our two states. And we've now create, constructed a network of transitions. And the numbers here refer to the energy barriers between the different nodes in the network. So once we've constructed that, we can use the tools of uh, graph theory to, and, uh, together with master equations to, to calculate rates and see how they depend on different things. So that's what's happening in simulation. What can neutrons do? Well, neutrons can do the same thing in principle. You see, each of these little transitions is a barrier crossing. Each of them. And uh, one barrier crossing event will lead to a uh, form of neutron scattering called quasi-elastic scattering. So each of these would, be, would contribute to our quasi-elastic scattering spectrum from this protein. Huh? Each of these individual steps along the pathway. And you can even guess, looking at this, how it would contribute. Because what happens is the width of the quasi-elastic scattering is proportional to uh, 
1 over the, the rate. So things with high barriers, such as this, these are very slow transitions, and they will lead to narrow quasi-elastic peaks, whereas things with the low barriers will lead to wide quasi-elastic peaks. So that's kind of the theoretical construct that, that we're working on to describe dynamic neutron scattering experiments in terms of a, a, a transition network of uh, molecules in different states. And if anybody um, gets the Journal of Chemical Physics and looks at the last issue, you'll they'll see we have two papers on this, one describing the theory and another uh, uh, example. And uh, they even chose it for the cover. Now, these, these covers of journals these days uh, seem strange because journals don't have covers anymore, do they? We just picked everything off up the net. So, um, anyway, it's, a, it's the cover of JCP. Now, this is our uh, theoretical way of constructing these networks. You can see them being constructed nice and beautifully. And um, the you can describe connectivity of paths through them. I'm going to skip over this stuff quite quickly now. It's a description of pathways through energy landscapes that molecules might take. Skipping it over. And I want to mention one other thing. This uh, um, is another type of conformational transition that isn't so sloppy as the one in the RAS oncogene. So this is muscle contraction, and uh, it's the active site of the muscle protein myosin uh, in which this uh, ATP molecule here is hydrolyzed by the water. So this is using this technique of uh, QMMM, or quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics, that was the technique explicitly uh, cited for the Nobel Prize three weeks ago. And what you do is calculate reaction mechanisms. I don't have the movie again. But the point is the following for neutrons. We have a single water molecule that will hydrolyze this bond in ATP. And the positions of these hydrogen atoms, this one, this one, this one, are critical to determining the reaction mechanism. The orientation of the water molecule, whether it's pointing with the oxygen that way or another way um, is very important to know and you can't find it out with x-rays no matter what the x-ray crystallographers say. So we do need neutron crystallography to find these things out, to find out the exact positions of hydrogen atoms in enzyme active sites. Anyway, the result of this ATP hydrolysis is a a large-scale conformational transition in myosin, which is a bit stiffer. I'm going to skip over that, because firstly, we don't have the movies, and, uh, and, and go to how we could possibly detect motions like this using neutron scattering. And the technique is spin echo. Now, you probably had this explained to you already, spin echo spectroscopy. But the point is the following. You know, I mentioned that um, high energy resolution is what allows you to probe long timescales. That means detecting very small differences in energies of neutrons. Neutron with uh, or small differences in wavelengths. Uh, so to do that, uh, the technique that uh, Ferry Mezai uh, came up with. It's called spin echo, and that involves um, letting neutrons travel through a magnetic field so that their spins process, measuring the precession angle and the time spent in the magnetic field gives you the velocity of the neutron and hence its energy very accurately. So what does spin echo do? Um, the, let me see, 
Right. I'm going to describe this very, very kind of uh, um, phenomenologically. What we measure is something that's called a Q-dependent diffusion coefficient. So Ming's question concerned diffusion coefficients. Now you can think of one. And here's the way to look at that. If I have a system, such as a protein, and I decide I'm going to measure coherent scattering, I'm not incoherent. This depends on pair correlations between different atoms, such as this one and this one. So each of these atoms will, will move relative to each other uh, over a certain time scale. And you can imagine that relative motion has an effective diffusion coefficient. In other words, the rate of motion, if you like, between here and here may be different between here and here. And the distance between the atoms is proportional to 1 over Q. So you, could, you have a Q-dependent diffusion coefficient, effectively. That's the principle. And you can, with some horrible approximations, measure this using spin echo. You can get a diffusion coefficient as a function of Q. Now the problem is this is done in solution, and there's whole molecule diffusion, which is boring for most people, whole molecule translational diffusion and rotational diffusion. For some systems, it's interesting. But for this one, we want to see internal motions. So you have to find a way of subtracting those. Well, the translational diffusion is easy. Turns out, if you do the math, it's Q independent. So it's just a straight line. The rotation, that's not so easy. Rotational diffusion is looks rather a lot like internal motion. So you have to find a way of doing that. But anyway, here's, 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 here it's done. And you see experiments performed showing this Q-dependent diffusion coefficient peaking at a certain distance. That's when you get fast motions happening in the protein at a certain distance. What is this? How are we interpreting that? This is, this is uh, data from the Richter lab in Yiddish. I think he gave, he probably presented these data earlier on anyway. Well, we can calculate the same thing from simulation. We can calculate everything from simulation. Here it is. That's the same form. We're happy. Things diffuse relative to each other quickly, exactly where we thought they would. That's great. But if you look at the numbers, our diffusion coefficients calculated from simulation are 10 times lower than the experimental ones. Experimentally, he has, they have a wild and floppy thing, whereas we have a rather stiff thing. And we are arguing with each other right now as to why that's the case. So, are the experiments wrong? Are the calculations wrong? Are both wrong? It's an important thing for a scientist to figure out. And, uh, so it, I would say we haven't yet got a really solid way of interpreting neutron spin echo in, in proteins, at least. That that's, needs some development. Okay. Um, I want to, I'm going to skip through more stuff. Um, and let's do a little bit, I'm going to skip through, come back to it if I have time. I just want to mention Dijon narrowing, if I can get that far. Because I'm talking about spin echo. I said, well, I won't get to talk about biomass. And uh, degen narrowing is here. See, this is our latest thing. This is, this is how we think spin echo is described. By a simple principle from, of uh, protein molecules. This is this spin echo experiment. As I mentioned, you derive a Q-dependent diffusion coefficient. And this is the measurement for uh, this crab-like protein. And this is how you get it. Don't have time to explain how you get it, but 
Q-dependent diffusion coefficient. And what we reckon is that this is Degen narrowing, and that Degen narrowing describes all of spin echo in proteins, and that you don't even need to do a spin echo experiment. You can predict what the answer is going to be anyway. <laughs> so here's the Degen was a polymer physicist. Um, a theorist, and he came up with this idea about 50 years ago when he's looking at um, completely different systems, um, just atoms and crystals and things. If you have two objects, it can be two atoms, or two protein domains, or two lipid molecules, or something, um, and they are as distant as are apart. And that if they have a preferred distance, R0, and you measure the small angle scattering, or the, the S of Q, there will be a peak in S of Q at 1 over R0, 1 over R0, peak, due to this preferred distance. The effective probability distribution has a peak at R0, yeah. and the potential that corresponds to that is the inverse of the probability distribution. So here's our potential. The idea of Degen narrowing is, is really simple. It says that if you're at the bottom of the potential, you don't want to leave. Whereas if you're high up, you want to get out of there as quickly as you can. So uh, the diffusion coefficient at the bottom of the potential will be low. And the one away from the bottom, the not at the minimum, the diffusion coefficient is going to be fast, if you like, it's the first derivative. Therefore, in um, a dynamic neutron scattering experiment, the S of omega will be narrow at the point where you get your diffraction peak. And this is this narrowing, this is this degen narrowing, it's narrowing of the the response, if, if you remember, um, slow motions give narrow peaks in energy, whereas fast motions give wide ones. So when you're up here, you're moving fast and your spectral response will be broad, whereas when you're here, you don't want to move and so your spectrum is narrow, and the diffusion coefficient then is slow up here and faster. And so D of Q against Q is simply one over the structure factors, one over S of Q. Isn't that simple? So, and we reckon that all you have to do is take the inverse of the small angle scattering profile of your protein and you will get the spin echo spectrum. So there's hardly any need to build spin echo spectrometers anymore or do the, or do the spin echo experiments. I'm being a little bit provocative there, right? But uh, the principle is, seems to be quite simple. So we're just writing and writing that up now. Here's an example of how it works. This is molecular dynamics of this crab molecule in which we directly calculate the spin echo. And then we calculate it again from the simulation, but as one over the structure factor. Works pretty well, doesn't it? And here's experiments. This is a Sachs profile for that, in which you just invert it, and this is what was measured experimentally. So fits pretty well. Yeah. All right, this is generally. Now, let's go back and finish off with small angle scattering. This, by the way, is the time for everybody to type in questions. Type in questions. Yeah. This is what I'm talking about. You've heard about small angle scattering. And um, the uh, use of it in biology is mostly this kind of thing. In, well, in proteins, it's mostly this kind of thing. It's to find shapes of objects by looking at the low Q region and uh, measuring things like the radius of gyration, fitting. Um, collections of spheres and shapes 
find solution structures at low resolution. But uh, what, what I thought I'd just briefly mention to you was what happens if you look at slightly long, slightly higher Q, and you have a, a chain that uh, um, is flexible. And this actually could be relevant for some of these intrinsically disordered things that people are looking at. And I'm not really up to date on what's happening with those, so they may well have subsumed the work that, that I wanted to teach you about today. Um, small angle scattering, you can write it in terms of the scattering lengths times this Debye function. So you see it depends simply on the distance between atoms I and J. Configurationally averaged, that's what this is. You average over time and space. Um, so what we, what we decided to do was to um, completely unfold a protein molecule. And look at the small angle scattering from that. It becomes a random polymer then, doesn't it? If you, now this, I'm not talking about heating a protein molecule up. That doesn't do much to it. Stops it from working, but um, doesn't really unfold it. I'm talking about really smashing the protein up without breaking the chemical bonds. So this is putting a strong denature in it, like 4 molar guanidinium chloride or something, and then looking at the chain statistics. So you get this type of model. This is PGK, phosphoglycerate kinase. And in the folding funnel description of a protein, which is here, in which the native state is one small point, and we've already seen the native state can have many different minima, but that's on a smaller length scale. The unfolded ensemble would be the rim of this folding funnel. Here, this is the energy huh, in physiological conditions. So from any of these points, an unfolded protein will go downhill and fold in physiological conditions and meet various hurdles on the way. So, small angle scattering. In the last uh, five minutes or so, if we unfold a form, form of guanidinium chloride and we put our protein in there, we know that the radius of gyration, this, you obtain that from the very low Q uh, small angle scattering, it's hugely expanded from 23 angstroms to 90 angstroms. So there's the expansion of our protein chain. Okay, what if small angle scattering has only that as information? If that's the case, then one big sphere will model the difference. It's just a bigger sphere with, with two different radii. If you do that, though, this is what you get. There's one sphere, um, whereas the experiment is, is these points here. So that doesn't give you enough intensity at high Q. That fails. OK, what if we have 10 spheres? So we're now constructing something called a freely jointed chain. This is a joint in our freely jointed chain. And when it's freely jointed, this angle can take any value. The angle between the two, two uh, inter-unit inter vectors. Uh, so that this sphere here can even overlap with this one. They can occupy the same space in this model. Um, so it's a little bit unrealistic, but it's the simplest kind of random polymer model. And if we have 100 spheres, um, so that's about 4 amino acid residues reduced per sphere, that fits pretty well, right? So, so that's obviously much better for modeling of unfolded protein than one big sphere would be. Yeah? But then we can do something called a crack key plot. That's here. Q squared times the... the uh, that's Q squared times S of Q. So written as P of Q, but it's S of Q. And here we see 
We're going out now to larger values of Q. See, this is 0 0.1 inverse angstroms. Um, but if we do a crack key plot and go to larger Q, that doesn't work either. This is our best freely jointed chain. So freely jointed chains, they, they say goodbye to us at that stage. They're not complicated enough. Instead, you need an excluded volume chain. That's, that's where these, these volumes cannot um, occupy the same space. They bump into each other. There's some hard sphere there. We can't solve this analytically. We need a, a, a small, small computer program to do it with the Monte Carlo approach. But here you can adjust your model and show that excluded volume chains fit the whole of the data here. Yeah? This, this one means that 0 0.7 of the radius of the, of the spheres is the kind of hardcore cannot overlap. And that's our model of a protein. So that just demonstrates that, that small angle neutron scattering can provide information on the statistics of configurations of chains. Uh, you know, the shapes of chains such as these. And this, these are atomic detail models based, ba built based upon those spheres that I just showed you, these overlapping spheres. And I think that's where we're going to um, leave it. You see these atomic detail models of protein chains from small angle scattering and simulation. And uh, with that, thank everyone for their attention. If there are any more questions, do feel free to type. Um, I'll wait a few seconds in case anybody's got some questions. Oh, Penn State, can you give more, more information about the difference between a classical harmonic oscillation and a quantum harmonic oscillation? Well, yeah, um, a, a quantum harmonic oscillator has a zero point energy. So even at zero kelvins in a quantum system, um, there will be some mean squared displacement, some motion take place. It's never, things are never completely still. That's, that's due to the uncertainty principle. And so at low temperatures, where this zero point energy is really significant, um, this affects the temperature dependence of the mean squared displacement. And also, if you solve the equation, you'll see that the, the dependence is not quite linear. If you look up basic physics textbooks for a simple harmonic oscillator and then a simple quantum harmonic oscillator, you'll see how those are derived. These are um, basic potentials on which one can derive quantum mechanical energies and Hamiltonians, wave functions. And uh, you'll find that that's described there. Okay, with that, I will say thank you, everyone. And uh, I don't know if people can see what's written in there. And I um, um, look forward to seeing you all around the neutron scattering me meetings and uh, various places, beamlines in the future. Bye bye. Here we go.